Well, as I mentioned to you earlier, we are in the middle of our teaching series entitled Peacemaking. We've been spending a couple of weeks talking about our individual responsibilities, taking personal inventory, recognizing that real peace comes through Jesus himself. Uh, next week, I'll be talking a little bit more about our corporate responsibilities to each other uh, as we are in the peacemaking. Uh, and then the final week, we're going to just talk about how that brings us together in a body that is unified. This morning, right in the middle of all this, uh, it's been my privilege to invite Dr. Alan Robinson to be with us this morning. He's the National Director for the Brethren in Christ Church USA, and uh, he, I've asked him, and he'll rib me a little bit about the fact that he's the one who's going to be speaking on this, but our denominational position on peace. We are a uh, Anabaptist denomination. That's one of our core uh, theological roots, and in that is our peace position as a denomination. And while we have a lot of military here as part of our church family, uh, I also felt it was very important for us to be able to have clearly articulated uh, where we are, at least on this journey, because it really is that as well, uh, but where we stand in this area of peace. And I can't think of a better person to invite than Dr. Alan Robinson to be able to share that with us. He's got a great story. Um, the first service was awesome, and it's only going to get better now that he's a little bit more warmed up. And uh, I'm going to pray for him. And then I'm going to turn it over to him. So, Father God, thank you uh, for bringing Alan to us today. Uh, thank you for the words that you have given to him. I believe that they have come from you and that he is going to share that with us. I pray, God, that our hearts and, and our ears will be open today. Uh, may we hear what your Spirit is saying to us. Uh, may we be able to process that, God, as we move from this place. And so I just pray, pray, God, your Holy Spirit, have a special anointing on Alan as he shares with us now. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Encounter Church. First service was better with that response, but that's okay. It is a joy for me to be here today. The, the ribbing that uh, Terry referred to was that on this day in your series, and, and I'm so thrilled at this series that you're doing, uh, peacemaking, how do we live peaceable lives as individuals in our homes, in our families, in our workplaces, in our communities? But when it comes to the issue of our world and countries and war and military and all of those big, huge issues, Terry asked me to come and speak about it. This is my first time to be here at Encounter Church on a, on a Sunday morning for worship. I've been here in your building for numbers of other meetings, but I'm just thrilled to be here today. And, and I'm glad for the opportunity to talk about this issue, this question, what is the question? And it's a question that Christians, the followers of Jesus, have wrestled with for 2,000 years. So let's just take a little bit of pressure off ourselves this morning by, by acknowledging we are not going to solve it once and for all today. For 2,000 years, people who say we follow Jesus have wrestled with this ever since the time of Jesus. And so we're going to talk about really big, difficult, complex, and, and sometimes very painful issues. Because this is, this is not just a theoretical issue that we sit here and think about and it's somewhere out there and it doesn't impact us. We're all impacted. And some of you may have been really impacted because you have yourself or members of your family have served or perhaps have died in the wars of this world, in military conflict. And even today, there may be some of you who have loved ones serving. So I acknowledge how difficult this subject is, how controversial it can be, and how painful it can be. A legitimate question you could ask, well, who are you to talk about this? So what's your story? And I'll just two or three minutes, hopefully, to tell you that. My, I have not served in the military. My grandfather served in the Irish regiment of the British Army in the First World War, because I'm from Britain. I'm born in Belfast, Northern Ireland. During the First World War, my, his family, his name was William Robinson, which is my name. I go by Allen, which is my middle name, but William Allen is my, my name, and my father was William. I, grandfather is William, and all the men in our family are William Robinson. So he 
his family received a letter during World War I to say he'd been, he was missing, presumed, killed in action. My father uh, had the copy of that letter, and I remember sitting with my dad and looking at it. But then another one came several months later from the British government to say that he had been located in a German prisoner of war camp. So he, he lived out the rest of the First World War in that uh, camp, and then came back to home, Northern Ireland, and lived the rest of his life, died in his early 90s. My father served the RAF, the Royal Air Force, during World War II as a technician, a mechanic. He wasn't in the military, but a civilian Air Force base in Northern Ireland was commissioned, taken over by British Air Force, and so he was working there as a civilian employee, and uh, that's his military-connected service. I was born and brought up in Northern Ireland, which has struggled with terrorism and fighting for the last, well, the last hundred years, really. But in the 1960s, when I was born, it was reaching a peak. And my family and my extended family have suffered in the terroristic wars of Northern Ireland. My grandparents were burned out of their home because they were of the wrong religion, living in a community that should have been a different religion, according to the people. They were burned out when my grandmother was eight months pregnant with her first child, my, my uncle. Uh, I had an aunt who limped the rest of her adult life after a firebomb was thrown through their living room window. And I've lost friends who have died in the military in the Northern Ireland context. My sister and her husband um, served as part-time soldiers in that conflict, didn't suffer um, didn't suffer any physical trauma, but who knows what mental trauma anyone might suffer. So but that's my family, that's not me. I pastored the Carlisle Brendan Christ Church just an hour from here where the U.S. Army War College is located. During my 14 years of pastoring there, there were many fairly high-ranking military people came to the church because we were a church in the community, and when they came to serve at the War College, they wanted to find a church. So I served as a pastor to a number of ranking military and also to professors and faculty members from the U.S. War College. I attended a weekly prayer gathering in the War College every week. I had been invited by one of the faculty. I uh, was invited to the annual uh, U.S. National Security Seminar in the early 2000s, right after 9-11, and was a participant in that um, invited group. And in our congregation, we had people who served in significant ways. So this is an issue that I've had to wrestle with in multiple ways as a pastor. One of the most difficult weddings I ever performed was where a family stood in front of me and on the ground was a spot where their son would have been. It was his sis would have been his sister's wedding, and his military uniform was folded in a flag in front of us. So you had father and bride and several other people in the wedding party in an empty space with a with a hat, because just the year before he was blown up through an IED explosion in Afghanistan. So as a pastor, I've had to wrestle with this with the issue of theology. What do I believe? But pastoral realities. Who are my friends and my family, my brothers and sisters? So I come to you from that kind of background today. Let me give you an overview of three questions that I want us to wrestle with, and we'll put them on the screen. Here's the three that will guide us. What did Jesus say? Number two, what did Jesus mean? And number three, how will we respond? Very simple questions. Time is limited. It's a big subject. I'll move quite quickly at some points, and hopefully there'll be enough material for your imagination to be stirred and some questions to be raised, and you can continue the conversation as a congregation and at some other time. So, what did, first of all, why Jesus? When the, we ask the question, what did Jesus say? It is a legitimate question to then say, well, why Jesus? Don't we believe the whole Bible? Jesus is a part of the Scriptures. My edition of the Bible actually has his words in red. Some of you may have that. 
Well, if you have the words of Jesus in red and you thumb through your Bible, there's a whole lot that's not red. It's Scripture. We believe the whole Bible. And it is a fair question, and it is a fair comment to say that not all of Scripture seems to say the same thing. After first service today, someone came up and asked me, well, what do you do with the Old Testament? It's a great question. The Old Testament has different perspectives. But we're only going to talk about Jesus today. But it is a fair question for you to wrestle, well, what do you do with the rest of the Bible when it seems to say something different than what Jesus said? But why Jesus? Well, turn over your bulletin. There's your first answer, why Jesus. I didn't know what your bulletin actually said until I got here this morning. But see your values of Encounter Church following Jesus, growing in Jesus, loving like Jesus, serving like Jesus, sharing Jesus. So you as a community have said, this is my interpretation of what your bulletin says, yeah, we believe the Bible, we believe Scripture, it's given by God, it's inspired, it helps us, but our values is to put Jesus first and to read Scripture through Jesus. That is actually the perspective of the Brethren Christ Church. Let's see what the Bible itself says about Jesus. We're going to put up three or four different scriptures. I'm just going to read them and let the words sink into your mind. Let's go to the first one. And by the way, I, I should say, Josh, who's running the slides, who was phenomenally good in first hour, has no manuscript. He doesn't know where I'm going. So I'll prompt him, and he'll prompt me, and together we'll journey. So here we go. Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out. Next one. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I just pause and think about that. The Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Next one. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Next one. This is the last one, and this is in the book of Hebrews. This is really important just to think about what's being said. In the past, and I pause there. A couple of times today, I'm going to use this platform as a timeline, so I'm going to go this way to be the past, because as you're looking at me, the timeline goes that way. So in the past, I, I'm going to go back even into the dark shadows, Old Testament, way back, 2,000 years, three, 4,000 years before Jesus, and it's kind of shadowy. We don't get it all. It's different. In the past, God has spoken. And so Hebrews gives us this timeline, spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but, but... In these last days, the writer of Hebrews says, has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through, also, through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Pause there, Josh, on that one. Just go back. We'll skip the next one. Think about that. The Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and is the exact representation of his being. So when we come to the Bible, God in the past spoke through the prophets in different ways. But Jesus is the most exact representation of the Father. So we as brethren in Christ, and typical for Anabaptist communities, we say we have a whole Bible, it's all inspired, it's all God-given, it's all helpful, 
but Jesus is the focal point of the whole thing. So, what did Jesus say? Let's turn to Matthew's gospel. The words will be on the screen as well. We'll read them from the screen. Matthew 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now, I'm fairly certain you've used this reference already in your series, so I'm not going to go into it, but that's what the whole series is, the peacemakers. And you can talk about peace in your personal life, in your family life, in your community. We're elevating it, I don't mean in terms of importance, but from a bird's eye perspective. We're talking the global, national, country, war, military question. What does it mean to be a peacemaker? What I really want you to think about is peacemakers are going to be called children of God. That's going to come up again in our next passage. Let's move on, Josh. You have heard, this is still in Matthew's gospel, it's toward the end of Matthew 5, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And I think most of us would agree that in today's world, the second part of that phrase, hate your enemy, is a fairly acceptable way of viewing our world when you think of the conflicts of our world and who our enemies are. We have enemies, they're bad, they want to kill us, we'll kill them first, hopefully. So, so our, our world view today, fairly common, and when I say our, I mean global, in every country. In the conflict in Northern Ireland that I grew up in, in Belfast, you really did hate your enemy. There was hatred, still is. So this, this perspective is fairly universal. Now what's interesting is that Jesus said, you have heard it said. He's referring to some common understanding that his hearers had heard from somewhere. Where is the question? In Matthew, you'll remember in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus quotes the Old Testament a number of times. You have heard it says this, but I say this. You have heard this, don't commit adultery, but I say this. You have heard this, you have heard. And all of those times he goes back to the Old Testament, Old Testament, Old Testament. But in this one, only the first part is from the Old Testament. Love your neighbor. You can find that various places. We don't have time to go look at them. But you can find the Old Testament law, love your neighbor. Remember when Jesus asked, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's Old Testament. But the second part, hate your enemy, is not in the Old Testament. So where's it from? Well, for most of our Christian history, we didn't know where it was from. But when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, and some of you may be familiar with archaeological discoveries, the Dead Sea Scrolls in Israel were uh, um, archaeological excavation discovered these manuscripts. And the manuscripts had been preserved in pots. They were part of a community called the Essenes, E-S-S-E-E-N-E-E-E-E-E. -E 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 -E. I don't know how many E's are in there, Essenes. This was a group of people. This was a subculture. You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and you had the Essenes. The Essenes were the radical revolutionaries, quote-unquote, terrorists of their day, or if a better word is freedom fighters, because they were living under the occupation of Rome. And the Essenes were promoting revolt and rebellion and acts of violence against the Roman oppressors. Well, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in that ex uh, archaeological excavation, is seen manuscripts were found that had that in it. What does that tell us? It tells us that there was a subculture or a culture within the Palestinian country where people were saying this as if it was the expected normal thing. They were developing the Old Testament to say something that it didn't actually say. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. You see, when you say something often enough, sometimes people begin to think it's actually real. You repeat something often enough, repeat a lie often enough, repeat some misrepresentation often enough, people 
a year or five or 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 years later. They don't know that well, that's not exactly right. So this, this phrase that Jesus is referencing was common in his day, but it's not fully Scripture. And that in and of itself would be a great lesson for all of us. What is it that we have heard and that we say that may have roots somewhere in Scripture but isn't actually what God said? Love your neighbor, hate your enemy, but I tell you, Jesus said. And when you, when you have the phrase, but I tell you, Jesus is contradicting or reforming or reinterpreting, reimagining the relationship of people to their enemies. What does he say? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven. I mentioned earlier when it said, blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the children of God. And here, love your enemies, that you may be the children of your Father. The only two times in Scripture that you have this cause effect, causal effect. If you do this, you're going to be like your father. If you do this, you're going to be like your father. So that's what Jesus said. What do we do with that? Well, we can ask a question, what did he mean? Because we all know that you can say something, but in a different context, it can mean something different. And if you've ever sent an email to the wrong person or read someone else's email, you might know what that's like. I could give you a number of examples where I have done that. And some of them are kind of embarrassing and awkward because you think you're spreading to one person and someone else gets it. And yeah, I didn't intend for that. So context matters. Two contexts I want to talk about, one more than the other for the sake of time. First one, historical. Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. Let's just round it out to that. Prior to the birth of Jesus, there had been an increasing sense of revolt in his country against the conquering Romans. So just imagine that all of us live in an occupied country. Now, in Northern Ireland, that's part of the problem that has caused terrorism for the last 100 years because some people think they're living in an occupied country. That's part of the issue. And I don't want to go into the politics of all of that. But imagine we're living in an occupied country. We have real enemies who are in charge. The, the manifestation of their domination of us comes in a number of different ways. But in Palestinian time of Jewish, in Palestine during Jesus' time, a number of ways were especially prominent. Number one was taxes. None of us like taxes. It's one thing paying taxes to your own government April 15th is coming. It's another thing paying taxes when you know they're going to another government of your oppressors who are also using those taxes to fund the military and the army who actually are oppressing you. That's a whole different thing. And so in Jesus' day, there were groups of people who were advocating, don't pay your taxes. Let's, let's be disobedient. Do you remember when Jesus was asked about taxes with a coin? Remember what he said? Give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Give to God that which is God's. It was a big issue. The second one, in addition to the taxation law, was just general civil law. The way that we get a glimpse into that issue was Roman soldiers were allowed to pick anybody. My sister here, you're going to carry my bag for a mile. That's what the law allowed. And then it's your turn. And then it's your turn. And I could pick any of you. Carry it for a mile. And remember what Jesus told his disciples? The expression that we use in everyday common language, oh, I'm going to go the second mile. It comes right from Roman law in the time of Jesus where Jesus said to his followers, if you are forced to carry it one, take it the second mile. Love your enemies. Can you imagine the conversation with a Roman soldier after mile one where he says, okay, put it down, I'll get someone else. No, you're good. Happy to do it for you, brother. Let's, let's have a conversation. Can you, that's a, that'll be an interesting mile to walk. 
with that soldier, but that was an issue, the law. So taxes, law, and the, the third one was that the Jewish religion had a lot of things that were sacred, and the Romans turned them all upside down and ruined them and desecrated them. Holy places, holy things, the synagogue, the temple, the holy of holies. It actually culminated in AD 70 when the Romans destroyed the temple because of a literal physical revolt of the Jewish people. This is when Jesus lived. So the historical context of Jesus was to live in a dominated society with a foreign power that taxed you, oppressed you, and desecrated your religion. And the Jews of Jesus' day had been longing for a Messiah who would overthrow the Romans and set them free. Their longing was for a militaristic Messiah who would, who would rally the troops by God's power, would overthrow the Romans, and not just the Romans, but they would have generalized to the Gentiles beyond just the Romans. They had an us against them. Their Gentiles will be destroyed, and the kingdom will come. The Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come. So the historical context, when Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for them so that you can be like your father, can you imagine how countercultural, how different, how weird, how strange, maybe even how naive? Because that's one of the things that people say today if you are of a peace tradition. That's just naive. No, Jesus would have sounded naive too. And he taught his people that the kingdom of God that was coming was not one of power and of might. It's not one of military overthrow. It's a kingdom of love and service and humility. So there's the historic context, but there's also the literary context. And if we had time, go back through Matthew chapter 5 and look at the various ways that Jesus talks about the Old Testament law. And remember, we did this timeline where you have all these prophets over here, and they're writing, and they're teaching, and they're saying, God has told me this, God has told me. And Jesus refers back to the Old Testament, and he says, you have heard, but I say, but I say, but I say. So the whole context of this passage is the kingdom of God that Jesus is bringing is not like the way they interpreted their Old Testament scriptures. It's not, it's not like what they thought. And there's lots of examples in this passage. I won't go into them for the sake of time. So that's what Jesus said, and we have to decide what he meant. What did the early Christians think Jesus meant. You know, it's really hard. I'm looking back 2,000 years. The world has changed a lot. This timeline that we're on from, and actually, if Jesus is at the center and that's 2,000 years ago, you and I are way over here somewhere. We're 2,000 years beyond Jesus and we're looking back. What did they think he meant? I can say what I think Jesus meant, but what did the early followers of Jesus think that he meant? Let's go through a couple of slides. Early Christians, and this, this one's a no-brainer, I think. If you're a Christian, you can't serve in the Roman army. I mean, at the time of Jesus, they're oppressing us, they're desecrating our holy places, all of that bad stuff. Yeah, I, I can't be a part of that. Okay, that's an easy one. But time's moved on. There's no evidence of a single Christian soldier after the New Testament times until A.D. 70. So after Jesus and his life and death through the A.D. 70, there's no history of any Christian serving at all as a soldier. Let's move on. But toward the end of the second century, so we're now 150, 170 years after Jesus' death, some soldiers became Christians. Now, 
I wish we could just pause and think about that. How does the witness of the church, how does the witness of Jesus' followers convert a Roman soldier? There are all kinds of things that are going on. And one that has come to my mind recently because of this coronavirus issue. You know, in the early church, when the plague was sweeping through communities, people would run away and segregate themselves. And it was the Christians who said, we will go and serve. Christians would actually move into the communities where the plague was at its worst to serve the sick. And you find historians of the time, and one of the most prominent historians of the time, Josephus, first century Jewish historian, but others, they talk about the way in which the early followers of Jesus really took it serious to pick up their cross, to follow Jesus, even if it meant the giving of their lives. Service was how they chose to live, which is just an interesting reflection on how we might choose to live today in those kind of situations. So some Roman soldiers become Christians. Well, now you have the, now you have the theological challenge. Can I stay a soldier? Is it okay for me to be in the Roman army? So this became an issue. The next, oh yeah, that's the one. Some Christian leaders and writers were concerned that Roman soldiers were now saying they were Christians. So they began to write about the issue. We're going to look at some of their writings. We're going to go through about three very quickly. Here's one. You can see when Oregon or Origen, however you pronounce it, lived. He explained that Christians must be wary about warfare and the vindication of our rights, which he didn't see in the life of Jesus at all, and said that Christian teaching did not permit anyone to take up the sword. Next one. This canons of Hippolytus or something like that. Kind of a, it's kind of a Sunday school curriculum, a book on discipline for the church. Here's what it said. This is the third century. It said that a follower of Christ who is a soldier must be taught not to kill men, and he would mean people, men, women, and to refuse to do so if he's commanded. And what's interesting about that writing is the fact that you have a follower of Christ who is a soldier. So you have people serving, and now it's, well, if you're there, you can't kill. And if you're commanded to kill, you can't do that. Why? Because allegiance to Jesus is greater than allegiance to your nation or to your commander. Next one. Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Cyprian. These are all people of the early church and all of them, without exception, caution fellow Christians to remember that they owe their allegiance to the spiritual kingdom. And is there one more, Justin? Let's, let's pause there. So, back to our timeline. You have Jesus teaching. And for two to three hundred years, which is as long as the United States has been a country, 1776, right? I'm not a born American, but I am an American today, naturalized. So we're not 250 years old yet as a nation. Can you imagine that if all of the writings of the entire length of the U.S.'s existence were uniform and said exactly the same thing? That's a long time. So for 300 years, the followers of Jesus said, it is not consistent with what Jesus has taught us if we go and take the lives of other people. We can't do that. It's just, it's wrong. We can't do that. Until this man. Constantine was a Roman emperor. He was a pagan, as they all were. But Constantine had his own conversion. He became a Christian, and he actually believed that God had revealed himself to him and the God said, if you will become a Christian and if you will fight in the name of the cross, and that's how they put a cross on their shields as a symbol, then I will give you victory. So Constantine, the Roman emperor, became a Christian. And instead of persecuting Christians, Christians first of all became accepted. And then later, Constantine passed a decree that said only Christians could be in the military. 
Well, that's a big change of events, isn't it? But that happened. So now the Christian church has to say, well, now what do we do? What do we do in a world that's changed? We know what Jesus said. We think we know what Jesus meant. We're living in a different reality. What do we do? So two Christian writers especially, we'll put Augustine as one and Ambrose was the other. They developed what became known as just war. And I'm not, when I say just war, I don't mean it's just a war. I mean it's just, justice, just war theory. Because they had to find some way to reconcile Christianity as they knew it with the Roman government that was Christian but that had a military and a war. And they tried to bring these two together even though for 300 years the followers of Jesus said no. So just war theory developed. Now you got our timeline, so we have Jesus, and we've got 300 years of the church, but now we have 15, 16, 1700 years, and you and I live here. We are the inheritors of 15, 16, 1700 years of just war theory. And you can check it online. It is a theory. When I would go to the U.S. Army War College, I would sit with professors and in classes and with students, and we would talk about just war theory. So you and I live in a world today where just war theory has become the normal accepted way for Christians to think about this complex problem. It's just good for us to know. It's not what the early church said. And it doesn't seem to be consistent with what Jesus said. When I became part of the Brethren in Christ Church 20 years ago, prior to that I'd been a pastor. I had several theological advanced degrees, including a master's degree out of Oxford University. So I was highly educated. I had pastored in Ireland, England, Scotland, and Wales. And I had never heard what I have just told you. I had never heard that it might actually be a problem for the followers of Jesus to be involved in armed conflict where they would take the lives of other human beings. I had never heard that. So when I became part of the Brethren Christ Church, it was a conversion again for me to begin to think through this. And then by chance, and it really was by chance, if you believe in chance, I believe in God's working out His purposes, so I'm using it loosely. I became a pastor in Carlisle, where the U.S. Army War College is located. That became an interesting journey. In October just past, I was back home in Northern Ireland. And I went to visit my, one of my very good friends who is a pastor in the denomination that I was from in Northern Ireland. My friend has visited me many times over here. I usually go see him when I'm over there. He had three sons. The youngest son had turned his back on faith, turned his back on God, got involved in alcohol and drugs and just a really bad life. We over here prayed for him back there. That young man came to faith in Christ, has had a tremendous change in his entire life, and today he's an associate pastor in the denomination that I came from. So in October, when I was visiting my friend, he and his wife, their youngest son came in. He's the associate pastor in probably the largest congregation of that small denomination. He'll probably become the next senior pastor because there's probably a transition coming soon. He's getting married this, November, this, this August. We've been invited to the wedding. So I'm sitting talking to this young man, associate pastor, and he said to me, what's that group you're a part of, Alan, over there? I said, well, we're the Brethren in Christ. What do you believe? Well, that's a big question. I said, well, let me tell you the things where we might be a little different than what you believe, because I'm from that denomination, so I know what they believe. Let me tell you the things are a little different. So I went down a couple of things, and I came to this issue, the issue of being peacemakers in our world. 
he listened really carefully to me as I went through it in, in short form, not, not this 20-minute sermon. And at the end of it all, he looked at me and he said, I have never heard that before. I need to think about that. So that's what I'm asking you to do. Some of you might never have heard about it before. I hadn't. He hadn't. Think about it. In this community, think about it. Pray about it. A great book is a resource. I used it a lot even preparing for today. Just published this year by a man called Ron Sider. teaches in Philadelphia. He's a Brethren in Christ person called Speak Your Peace. It's, it's a great little book. It comes to many of the questions that people want to ask. They say, okay, I hear you, but what about this? And what about that? And what about this? So I encourage you to take time to do that. Let me pray for you. Lord God, if we want to be peacemakers in this world, if we truly want to follow Jesus in this world, help us. In a world that's messed up, that's complex, that is filled with what we sometimes describe as really bad people. Give us wisdom. Give us discernment. I pray for my brothers and sisters here. Just help them to think about it so that all of us can truly follow Jesus in our lives for his honor and glory. Amen.